Now it's time for Lefties Losing It. And I regret to inform you that alleged comic Hannah Gadsby is at it again with this confused and painfully unfunny diatribe against men who think it's wrong for biological males to invade women's sport. They may not want their daughter's disadvantage in sporting events. They may not want a scholarship their loved one has worked years to achieve going to a male identifying as a female. Apparently, these men must shut up to make miserable Mona Hannah happy. I think it's adorable how so many men are all of a sudden very concerned about women's sport. <laughs> That's new. That's real new. Like, the idea that men are transitioning to become women so they can dominate women's sports. <laughs> Like, you know, pick up all those, those amazing perks you get in women's sports. <laughs> all those perks. Oh. It may have escaped Hannah's attention, but there are actually great perks in women's sport, from the sense of achievement to scholarships, sponsorships, selection in sporting events, from local carnivals to the Olympics. It's worth remembering that this lefty losing it is loved by the humorless leftist media. Just look at the critics' ratings of her Netflix special, Nanette. It received 100%, but the audience score, as you can see there, is a pitiful 26%. Now to another unfunny comic who doesn't have a Netflix special, but she sure has abundant reserves of vile, bitterness and anti-Israeli hate. Here is far-left comic Sarah Bartello mocking Jews who are currently under attack by anti-Semites. Apparently, it's all their own fault. Talk about victim blaming. ZVH, how can I help you? Yes, you've come through to the Zionist victim hotline. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you're feeling triggered and threatened, right? Well, it is on the rise, that's for sure. Can I ask what was the incident? Really, a watermelon badge. These people. These people have their no shame. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a lot to deal with. Yeah, I can, I can definitely empathise. Did you mention October 7? You did. That's great. That's good. Oh. They spoke about the 76 years of occupation. Interesting. They're really learning about the history that we've been trying so hard to cover up all these years, aren't they? <laughs> Oh, okay, so here's what I think you should do. I think you should wear as many Star of Davids as you can. Uh, yep, the same Star of David that we use to brandish Palestinian prisoners, amongst other things, and just call it anti-Semitic. Yeah, yeah, no, it works like a charm. Gross. Uh, now let's end on a positive note. Let's take a minute and admire a Christian man who politely and methodically schools a dude who questioned him about his Christian beliefs. You said, I'm from Africa. You are surprised that we from Africa worship a white man. Yes. And I said, you Muslims colonize many countries and you impose Islam and a God from Arabia on those countries that you went. Allah was not known in Africa. It was known only in Arabia because it's Arabic language, right? The Jews never mention Allah in all their books. You can, the best you can get close to is Elaha, which is not the same anyway. So the name Allah is not known by any of the previous prophets. It's a new name, and according to the Torah, we don't need to follow a, a God that is not known by our forefathers. Now, for you to say, we Africans worship a white man, it shows you are ignorant. Why I'm saying you are ignorant, respectfully, is because Jesus is not from Europe. He's from Israel. They are not white people. Joining me now is New South Wales Libertarian MP John Ruddick. John, let's start with the hard left councillor who wants landlords to pay quadruple the amount of council tax that owner occupiers would pay. This is a, uh, a plan that's been considered in Marybeck. This councillor was on Seven News doubling down on this lunacy. So landlords and uh 
property investors are actually causing the housing crisis. So we don't actually need any landlords they, uh, or property James, investors. They James, don't produce anything. They don't James, actually create housing. If you look at where, James, if you look at where the overwhelming proportion of um, the overwhelming James, proportion I've got to pull you of where up there. That, that's uh, not, that's lending not goes to, it actually they actually go most new most le lending goes to uh, for property investors goes to existing homes rather than new. So it's actually not true that investors produce anything. What they do is they actually hoard homes and then uh, rent them out at exorbitant rates. So we could actually really do without, really do without, James, um, without it, it, investors, I'm going to interrupt and that you would there. be better. <laughs> there you go, John. Uh, they don't need landlords in Mayor Rebecca. Uh, never mind that around a third of the residents of that council happen to be renters. Well, Rita, I've got a prediction, and that is that our young uh, councillor friend <clears throat> is never going to win the Nobel Prize for economics. Uh, because, look, uh, what we need to understand <laughs> is that housing is just another form of investment. OK, now, now, if people don't think they're going to get a good return out of investing in housing, they'll invest in the stock market or other private investments. So we need to make it... We need to be very pro-landlords, uh, pro-development. Now, where, where this person is coming from is... Uh, he doesn't have the right solution, but there is a crisis, and he has touched on the fact that there is a crisis. The crisis is caused, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, by excessive planning and zoning laws and the government meddling, meddling, black tape, green tape, red tape, everything. There is one city in the mm. United States which abolished pl planning laws in the 1950s. It's called Houston. It's the fifth biggest city in the United States. No planning laws. If you own private property, you can do with it whatever you want. Now, if we have that in Sydney and Melbourne, which is what our party stands for, we're going to see a, a housing boom. We're going to see rents come down and prices come down. And we're going to see some weird developments, though, John. Let's uh, not forget that. But let's go back to the economic illiteracy of this particular no. councillor. Uh, he explained his understanding of what would happen if property investors exited the market. Mm. So, yeah, so we do have a lot of renters in Marybeck. So the purpose of this proposal is to change the ownership composition um, of property in Marybeck so that we actually have fewer investors. And so what we're trying to do here is to make it unattractive for investors to invest in Marybeck so that they leave. And then what will happen is those houses won't disappear. They don't fall off the face of the earth. What that happens is that they become available for somebody else, um, particularly first home buyers. So what we're doing is we're reducing the number of investors in Marybeck and making more homes available for uh, first first but, home buyers but, to purchase, James, which I think is a great outcome. It's a great outcome because, uh, yeah, most renters, John, are ready to buy property. They have the deposit, the bank approval. They just need a genius like this to uh, make it happen for them. If this is the state of local councils uh, or some local councillors, uh, it helps explain why we have a housing crisis because we've got policies at the federal, state and local government level that frustrate developers, make people invest their money elsewhere, and meanwhile, rents are skyrocketing. Well, look, if this genius had his way and set all the housing policy in this country, what would happen is there would be no new ha houses built. And so we would have the existing stock mm. and, the, and the existing stock would go into uh, decay because no one would say it's just not worth me owning an investment property and renovating it and keeping it in, in, in good shape. So, uh, look, it's, uh, it's very sad that we can have people like this elected to council. People, the Australian voters neglect local council. It's very powerful little form of government, for, particularly for practical things like this. So, mm. uh, yes, the people that voted for this guy have, have got some explaining to do. But I tell you, I think people don't even know who they're voting for with local council elections. They, they don't know uh, what the policies are, which party affiliation they may or may not have. Um, and I think that's how we get a lot of the councillors, because people are obliged to vote, they're obliged to participate in this process or they're going to get fined. And they don't know what they're voting for. And as we covered last night, the number of rental properties in Victoria has fallen by over 10,000 in just three months. Another reason why rents are going up. Now, the coalition has announced they're behind a ban on social media accounts for youngsters. Peter Dutton has announced that his party will raise the minimum age for social media platforms from 13 to 16 years of age within the first 100 days of a coalition government. John, uh, what are your thoughts on this proposal? 
Well, I'm deeply disturbed by it. Look, Peter Dutton's better, better than Albo. That's, that's obvious. But, I mean, Peter Dutton's got an authoritarian streak in him. Now, what? Now, the, the two things, that whenever, whenever the regulators want to increase the power of the state and, and shut down the power, the, the freedom of the internet, they have two bogeymen. They say terrorists and pedophiles. The two worst people and the two worst groups of people in the world. So they say, look, we need to regulate the internet to stop those two groups. OK. Now, the reality is, is this. At the moment, yes, you've got to be 13 to open a Facebook account or whatever it is, OK? But the kids just say, yeah, they tick a button, say, yeah, I'm, I'm over 13. But what they're going to do by lifting it to the age of 16, you're going to need your digital ID, the good old digital ID, brought into us by the, the duopoly, Liberal and Labor, OK? And so, so then you really are going to have to be over the age of 16. Now, that means that we're all subject to the government approving our access to the internet. And it means the government's going to be able to know what we're looking at on the internet. So we've got to fight for internet freedom. And, and, and unfortunately, Peter Dutton just does not get it. John Ruddick, uh, I think it's an issue we're going to discuss some more in the weeks and months to come. Thank you so much for your time this evening.